thank you, Munisha, for that exceedingly generous introduction. Generous introductions always induce an element of insight. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my talk today is on uh, leadership derailment. Fundamentally, if you look at the amount of literature that is available out in the market on how to get to the top, it's substantially more than the literature that is telling you how to stay there. The literature that explores derailment to my mind, is at best fissiparous, non-coagulated, very haphazard, inauthentic. To explore the idea of derailment, to explore the idea of uh, failure, requires a gumption that I think we've still not had or put our minds to. If you think about what causes derailment, in fact, the tragedy of derailment or the tragedy of failure is a tragedy because the raw material required for success is the very same material, raw material, that causes or is required for uh, derailment or failure. People who derail, people who fail, is not because they lack the ability. They have the ability. They have phenomenal capability, stamina, energy, audacity, intellectual acumen. They are bright, they are brilliant, and yet why do they fail? It seems there is a virus that infects them. Something that affects not the hardware, but the software as it were something in the persona that begins to distort the inner eye, begins to distort the way they look at reality around them and how they begin to relate with that reality. In fact, the very attribute that causes their rise, that causes their success, beyond a point of seniority, beyond a point after time has passed, uh, is the attribute that causes their derailment. And the Greeks were, had a word for it. They called it hamashia. Hamashia as in fatal flaw. Fatal not as in fated, but fatal as in an attribute in your personality that causes your rise, that creates conviction inside of you that this indeed is the way forward. And yet when you arrive at a point, at that point, in a different context, when the times have changed, when the expectations have changed, your ability to snap out of the paradigm that caused your success from the past has reduced or is non-existent. And therefore, you carry on behaving as you are behaving in the new context. That very attribute that caused your rise is the one that is about to cause your fall. If you look at all the literature on derailment, there could be 13 or 14 attributes. But all of them will migrate under at least three or four. One is arrogance. Arrogance means arrogare, coming from the Latin word arrogare, a desire to accumulate, a desire to have for oneself. Why does one have an irrational desire to possess and have one for oneself when you know at some part in your consciousness that you came with nothing and after a while you will go with nothing? In the finest analysis, like Steve Jobs says, you are naked. So in the middle, what is this fuss about? How come if you come with nothing and you go with nothing, in the middle you are obsessed with acquiring, acquiring and acquiring? Well, if you look at the word human being, the human was designed to be a being. But he has gone ahead and become a human having, obsessed with possessing either name or fame or power or money or adulation or admiration. In the desire to have, he has to do. So the purpose for doing is having. The purpose of doing is not being. And any doing that takes you more and more towards having is likely to hit a point of irrationality, which the Greeks had another word for this and they called it peripetia. Peripatia means the context has changed. The exact opposite is beginning to happen. The overarching paradigm's demand from your intelligence is different. But you don't have a cognition of what the demand is and you carry on behaving as though you were behaving in the past. Because of your success, you have now begun to believe in your own seniority, in your own superiority, in your own ability. There is a conviction that I know you don't. I have arrived here not by accident, I have every evidence to say that what has worked for me in the past, and therefore when you look towards the future, you have closed yourself to feedback. No more information or data is coming in. Nothing is allowed to challenge your assumptions. And you carry on behaving the way you were behaving. Arrogance means arrogare, a desire to accumulate, a desire to be seen as superior, a desire to be seen as great. The next attribute that is generally talked about is hubris. Hubris means excessive pride. It's not just excessive pride. In fact, it's an excessive pride that has an element of uh, something much grander, much deeper, 
far more profound in its self-destructive ability. A kind of a pride that blinds you and you acquire an inability to see. A classic example is Julius Caesar himself. When he was told, Julius Caesar, today is the 15th of March, your wife's had a bad dream, there are indications out there that you shouldn't go. It is dangerous for you to go. He turns around and tells his people, danger and I are like two lions littered on the same day, born on the same day, and I being the elder is more dangerous than he. You know, it is one of the strangest things that people should fear death. Cowards die many times before they really die. The valiant never taste of death but once. And it amazes me how people are afraid of death, knowing full well that it will come when it will come. Where is this in pride? And in less than six hours' time, a Julius Caesar, the foremost man of the ancient Roman Empire, is dead. The third reason is very often attributed to narcissism, self-love. Love of the self. Love of the self to the exclusion of everything else. It's a goddess's curse to Narcissus. Narcissus is so handsome, so attractive, that many women fall in love with him. But he continues to refuse them. A goddess falls in love with him, and he refuses the goddess. And then there's a curse on him. And the curse is, may he that does not love others, love himself. Self-love is a god's curse. Narcissus, unknown to himself, that's carrying the burden of this curse, unknown to him, He's horse riding, hunting, on one occasion when he's thirsty, he leans across a pool to drink water and he sees the reflection of a truly handsome, attractive person. And he pines and pines and pines until he dies of exhaustion and fatigue and starvation. Unknown to himself that the only one he was seeking there was himself. This kind of self-love is also self-destructive. So what happens? As the graph of your success rises, the context has changed. A changed context is now asking you to behave in a different way. Asking you to relate in a different way. Asking you to re-examine reality. Asking you to re-examine the assumptions on which you are operating. An inability, apparently, or an unwillingness is now acquiring a pathology of its own. A pathology means now you require an external intervention uh, to bring to your awareness. But at this time, you're not open to any feedback, you're not open to coaching, you're not open to being taught. What are the chances that a coach could have come to Julius Caesar and said, hey Julius, just hold on a minute, you know, I've been your coach, I want to tell you, it's not safe to go out there. What are the chances Julius Caesar would, hurt, would have hurt that person? What happens, what is tragic, is as the graph turns downwards, you are headed towards derailment, you think you are headed in this direction. Since you're not receiving any more new information, you don't know this is happening. But you have an x-axis that says time. And as time is passing, you're moving further and further away from where you think you are. You think you are here, but actually you are here. You think you are here, but actually you are here. You think you are there, but actually you are there. As you're passing further and further, it's becoming more and more difficult for you to look back. The first major error you make is an error of decision. <coughs> that impacts the rate of return, that impacts your business, you lose a customer. Major mistake. But the organization says, you know, he's done very well, he's done exceedingly well, let's give him a chance, let's handhold him, let's coach him, let's put him through training. But actually you've not responded to any of that and you go further down. The second major mistake you make is with a person or with people. You hire some wrong people. You lose the trust of your seniors. You lose the trust of your promoter directors or your managers. Your senior, senior management no longer trusts you. And at that point, it is no longer possible for you to look back. No longer possible. The energy and the effort and the trust from others required for you to look back is so Herculean that put very generally, you would be considered delayed. In literature and in mythology, derailment doesn't end with you losing a job or losing a promotion or losing an assignment. It generally ended with you, your death. So Julius Caesar would have to die. Prometheus would have to suffer unendingly. Oedipus would have to die. A heavy price to be paid. But at the point of death, especially in Grecian mythology as well as in Shakespeare, at the point of death, each character will not be allowed the luxury to die in ignorance. You must die in the knowledge of all the mistakes that you made. And the Greeks have yet another word for it, and they call this anagnorisis, recognition. 
Suddenly, when the dagger enters into his abdomen, Julius Caesar has to gasp and say, "A too brute, so." The knowledge that I was wrong vis a vis you all the time is a heavy price to be paid. Derailment has happened. Can you put up that graph that I have? This is the graph. So you have a fatal flaw that's causing your eyes. The context has changed substantially. Peripatia has happened. You have not taken cognition of the change dynamics. You carried on behaving the way you have behaving. M1 is the first mistake. M2 is the major mistake. I have something called there the Angulimal point. Angulimal, because he was a man who would cut off fingers of people he had robbed, put it as a garland, as a count of how many people he had killed. And yet when he encountered a Buddhist monk, he entered into the Sangha, transformed himself, became a Buddha, that is, became enlightenment. On one occasion when he was walking around the village uh, begging for food, people recognized that this is Angulimal, and they stoned him to death. Which means the consequences of your action will catch up with you even if you are enlightened. So there is no returning from here, none. There is no returning from the Angulimal point, but you're not allowed to die in ignorance. And ignorance. A good question to ask is, at what point can I intervene to prevent the derailment? Does the derailment happen in the peripetia? Does the derailment happen at M1? Or does the derailment happen long before a peripetia? Which brings us to the next part of the talk. And the next part of the talk has to do with transformational leadership. Transformational leadership is not about transforming others. It rarely is. It's about transforming yourself. Emily Durkheim said that the human being, actually homo duple, two levels of the human being. There is a lower level, the basement, and then there's a higher level. The basement is the one where you are pursuing the human having, a desire to have, a desire to possess, to be rich, to be powerful, to be known. And yet, insidiously, at the bottom of all these possessions is a secret, quiet feeling of, is this it? Isn't there anything more? What happens after this? What is the purpose of all this? Where is this headed? These questions are transcendental questions. And these questions lead you to want to move to the next level where you want to see a pattern in all human beings. Where you want to see a transcendence. Where you've now acquired an ability to be compassionate. And you're so compassionate that you can now transform other individuals who come in contact. There's a story of a woman whose son had died, a young child had died. And she ran to the Buddha. And she told the Buddha that my son has died, you the enlightened one, can you please save him? He said, yeah, I can save him. He said, then why don't you? I said, I'll need a fistful of mustard for that. He said, all right, so I, I can get you mustard. He said, yeah, go ahead, get me a fistful of mustard and I'll save your child. And as she's running away, he says, but get it from a house where nobody has died. He said, sure. And she runs, goes to a house and says, can I have a mustard? My son has died, the Buddha will. And they said, yeah, here's a mustard. He said, but did somebody die here? They said, only last year my father-in-law died. Another house, only year before my mother-in-law died. Only this year, my only this. And as she's running from home to home, home to home, suddenly she slows down. Suddenly there's a realization. And as she's clenching at that fist full of mustard seeds, she lets it fall. The death is inevitable, that it can't be reduced. That death is the fairest of all God's transactions to man. Buddha was not contemptuous for her ignorance, didn't chastise her for her apparently immature approach to a phenomena called death. With compassion, he said. A transformational leader therefore has compassion, a deeply empathy. If you look at the research on transformational leadership, one of the dimensions of transformational leadership is individualized consideration. You are considerate to individuals. Each one is an individual to you. It's not an employment number. It's not a designation. It's not a plain face. It's a person. Flesh, blood, bones, and emotions. You get interested in the person. You become empathetic. You become compassionate. This is a critical attribute of the transformational leader. The second attribute of the transformational leader is his ability to inspire people. And he inspired people by role model behavior. By role model behavior. So he behaves authentically. He behaves with integrity. Because he becomes a role model, not because he desires to be a role model, but because he desires to be as close to his authenticity as possible, and others look admiringly towards it. 
and therefore becomes a role model. What he says, what he does, what he thinks, what he aspires, and his ability are in alignment, not in malignment. And because they are in alignment, they are inspiring to other people, role model behaviors. This, by far, has the greatest influence on transforming other people. Not only is it driven by a vision, a desire to attract other people, to take other people forward, to transform other people, to make other people go into the next level of the duplay. If you look at the story of Don Quixote, Don Quixote de la Mancha, Don Quixote as it is called, Don Quixote is charging at windmills, wanting to destroy windmills, saying that these are monsters. And Sancho Panza is saying, no master, they are not monsters. They are windmills. Sancho Panza is the practical, sensible, down-to-earth, grounded, uh, detail-oriented person. Don Quixote is this idealistic, foolish, chasing at one monsters, wanting to destroy monsters because they are not good for us. In real terms, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza don't exist outside there. They are part of our own psychology. In me is a practical, pragmatic, down-to-earth human having. In me is the idealistic. The compassionate, the transcendent, the wanting to include others, the wanting to help others. In helping ourselves, it is in helping others, it is ourselves that we help. In healing others, it is ourselves that we heal. That orientation. So Don Quixote in our personality, Sancho Panza in our personality is the one that is driving. There's a tendency to drive from becoming Sancho Panza from being Sancho Panza to becoming Don Quixote as a continuum. A transcendental leader has an element of the foolish. A transcendental leader has an element that makes him hungry for knowledge, for understanding, for being including, for being included. So if you look at it, leadership derailment is caused by a set of attributes, but these I think can be addressed to, like a vaccination, by being transcendental, don't be exhorting in your approach, in your orientation. Thank you.